Good evening and welcome to this very first pilot episode of the Late Night Conference show. My name is Wilhelm Huck and I'm your host tonight. Before we start, I would like to make a few moments to explain our motivation for organizing this Late Night Conference. As you know, the Corona pandemic has very much disrupted our normal way of life and work. However, it has also made clear that modern technology can connect us with people across the globe in a pretty efficient way. Whilst meetings and conferences in person are very much more enjoyable to exchange ideas, to hear the latest gossip and share a drink or two with other scientists in your field, online tools, we believe, do open up the scientific debate to a much broader audience. And that is exactly what we hope to do. We are very much hoping that bachelor and master students in Nijmegen, in the Netherlands, across the world really, will join us to hear about cutting edge science, to get to know the person behind that science, learn about their passions and motivations for doing the research, and maybe get some advice from them on how to take the next steps in your career. Starting in January, we will kick off with our very first season exploring the origins of life in five or six episodes spanning chemistry, geology, astronomy, related disciplines. So stay tuned, we will have some pretty amazing speakers for you. Before we get to that though, we have our very first in-house excellent scientist. And it is my pleasure to introduce Maike Hansen to you. Maike did her PhD here in Nijmegen, working on stochastics of cell-free gene expression. After that, she moved to the Gladstone Institutes in San Francisco for postdoctoral work, where she did absolutely top-notch work on noise-related gene expression in HIV-infected cells. We are very fortunate to have her back here in Nijmegen, where she started as a tenure-track assistant professor in the Department of Biophysical Chemistry about a year ago. And her central research question centers on how robustness emerges from molecular complexity. In a few moments, Maike will start her presentation. After that, there will be ample opportunity for all of you to ask her lots of questions. If you want to engage in the discussion, please put your questions on the chat. No need to wait till after the lecture. I very much look forward to a lively, interactive discussion. But first, I'm really keen to hear what Maike has to say. Maike, the screen is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Willem, for this uh, very nice and kind introduction. And thanks a lot uh, for inviting me to be the first speaker on this pilot session. So tonight, I want to talk to you about um, how cells commit to the decisions that they make. Um, so from a very simple view of how cells might make their decisions and then commit to them, we can imagine that cells could potentially have um, have a choice between two different elevators, like shown here in this picture, where the choice itself is a probabilistic choice that is binary, where there's not much stimulus from the outside, um, which elevator will be chosen, the left or the right one. Therefore, it's a purely stochastic and probabilistic choice that will be made. And once that choice is made, then it's, um, uh, it's st the, the choice is, is fixed, right? So you get into the elevator, there's no way, unless you're James Bond, there's no real way to leave, meaning that you'll stay in that chosen lift, the right or the left one, for as long as, um, uh, for as, long as the elevator continues upwards. So from a cell's perspective, what would that mean? That would mean that a cell that uh, might commit to a certain lineage where there would potentially be a probabilistic choice to turn into maybe a fat or a muscle cell that then once that decision has been made, the cells will um, commit to that decision and continue down that lineage. However, we do know that that decision process is way more complicated than a simple binary choice between two elevators. There are um, many different stimuli that um, push the cell in one direction or another, like advertisements in our daily life pushing us in one, uh, to make one choice versus another choice. So the whole decision-making process of a cell, especially following certain lineages, is way more complicated than this stochastic or, or, or uh, probabilistic decision-making process. So how can we imagine it? 
we can think about it as a energy landscape where the cell might be at the top of this energy landscape and have a lot of potential energy. And what that would mean is that the, the external stimuli, like the advertisements that were shown in the previous slide, um, these external stimuli would shape this energy landscape. So we have maybe extracellular matrix, cell to cell contact, maybe one cell secretes certain molecules that um, that, that cell will react to. You have growth factors, hormones, and other small molecules. And this will shape the landscape in such a way so that if this composition of stimuli changes, the landscape will change. Meaning that there are different preferential fates that are the lowest energy um, uh, uh, ultimate uh, fate that, um, that can be chosen. So if you imagine the cell to be more like a ball at the top of this energy landscape, you can see that uh, a fate that has the lowest energy, like this fate here, fate C all the way on the right, that that is ultimately the fate that might be chosen because due to the landscape and the composition of all the factors, this is the preferential and the, the most um, uh, energy favorable state for the cell to, to um, go down. On the other hand, if we change this energy landscape, again, due to all these external stimuli, then it might be a completely different fate that will be chosen. So that's the complicated view of how cells make a decision. Then we can move on to sort of the more noisy view of how cells make decisions. And, and this would compare to somebody who's maybe not very good at making decisions. So even though you have all the advertisements, all the stimuli that are pushing you in one certain direction, um, and also the logical direction, maybe you are still not very good at making up your mind. And therefore, the ultimate choice is still very probabilistic, because it doesn't really matter what everyone's telling you to do. It's all up in the air anyway. So how would this look on the energy landscape? You can imagine that the noisy um, view of the cellular of this cell at the top of the energy landscape could be seen as maybe kinetic energy. What that would mean is that the cell at the top of this energy landscape would essentially move across this energy landscape, exploring space of this landscape. So that even if um, if this this fate A here is the one that's the more favorable fate due to the high noise situation, it's ultimately a different fate that will be chosen. And that, so how can we study this probabilistic um, decision-making process? So we can do this by essentially flattening this energy landscape or this decision, this, this landscape that is, that is composed of these external stimuli. And by flattening it, we can purely look at this underlying probabilistic decision-making process. Essentially, um, uh, simplifying the decision-making process back to this very simplified binary probabilistic choice. So if we do that, we can, um, uh, we can actually, for example, look at the expression of two different proteins within a cell. And you can see that even when you flatten this landscape, and there are different ways in which you can do this. Um, in this case, you're looking at the population of genetically identical cells that have been grown up from a single cell. So that means that they all have the same um, genetic composition. The, they're grown in the exact same culture media, so they're all exposed to the same, um, uh, the same stimuli, the same, the same growth factors. Um, but still, you can see that there is a noisy decision process between this green and the red protein that is preferentially being expressed, even when we flatten this landscape. And this is very common. So you can actually see this, this noisy decision-making process through a number of different organisms. You can see it in E. coli, um, other bacteria, uh, embryonic stem cells, and C. elegans. Um, and these are just a couple of examples where you can see this, this, this uh, noisy decision-making process that generates the cellular diversity. And with cellular diversity, we just mean that one cell quite visually looks different than the other one because one cell will choose to produce more green protein versus another will choose to, to produce more red protein. So 
Um, what we can also, or what we know from literature, is that this cellular diversity can actually be selected both for and against, meaning that it's both beneficial and detrimental depending on the situation and the timing and um, the cells that, that are being looked at. Some examples where, um, where cellular diversity is, is beneficial is mostly sort of in bet hedging strategies. So for example, here you're looking at, a, at an image where bacterial cells are grown in, in these channel devices that allow um, tracking of, of, um, of bacterial cells that follow the same lineage. So what that just means is that when you're growing cells in just normal growth media, then all the cells that are along one line um, are, are coming from the same um, parent cell. So then um, all of these cells are exposed to ampicillin, so an antibiotic. And as it turns out, a couple of these cells are actually persistent against this antibiotic. And the authors, they did several different uh, follow-up studies. And it turns out that this is, um, it's, it's not genetic, it's not a permanent um, uh, change. And it's due to this uh, probabilistic decision-making process that's underlying the cellular diversity. So there's other examples as well where, um, where this, this diversity is actually detrimental. And that's of course logical, right? So um, for example, it's been shown that housekeeping genes actually have selected for certain features that reduce this, um, uh, this variability. And uh, I really like this image where actually during Drosophila development, it's been shown that multiple nuclei share the same cytoplasm and that this is a mechanism to reduce the, the variability because you can imagine if one nuclei will uh, produce much more RNA than all the surrounding ones. Since they're sharing a cytoplasm, it all buffers out. So these are examples where, um, where this diversity or this, this noisy decision-making process is actually detrimental. Um, so we quite clearly see these examples where it's either beneficial or detrimental. And the logical question is, how do cells switch from one to the other, right? You can imagine that, that for a cell, it might be um, good to be able to switch um, from having a high amount of variability to a low amount of variability, um, and to be able to do this in a temporal manner. Um, to be able to, to ask that question, we, use, we can use HIV as a model system. And the reason that HIV is, is such a nice model system to ask this question is because it actually has a binary fate outcome where, um, uh, where one, one of those, those choices is that the virus will undergo active viral replication and the other one is that it will um, go latent. So going a step back, um, when a patient is infected with HIV, what HIV does is it um, infects uh, T cells and it integrates into the host cell genome. So what that just means is that it sort of cuts open the DNA, puts itself in there, and then just sits there. And then it does this or undergoes this decision to um, start transcribing and translating a lot of mRNA and protein um, to generate new viral particles that then kill the host cell. And then these viral particles can spread and infect new cells. On the other hand, the other option is that once it integrates into the host cell genome, it can just quietly sit there. And it doesn't produce any mRNA, it doesn't produce any protein, which means it's also undetectable and cannot be killed by antiretroviral therapy. So therefore, for from the vir virus's perspective, it's beneficial for both of these um, for both of these choices to persist over a longer amount of time. So that's why we have these two nice um, nice uh, time points that we can study, where initially um, this decision needs to be made, and for that, it's probably it's um, beneficial for the virus to have. Um, high amount of variability or cellular diversity to be able to undergo this probabilistic decision. And then the, the next step, it's actually beneficial for the virus to, um, to commit to that, whatever fate it's, it's just um, undergone. 
So I'm actually going to tell you first how HIV does this, and then I'm going to show you some data to support that. Um, so uh, the way that HIV does this is actually um, encoded in its, its own circuit. And um, we can simplify it down to about three things that are necessary for this to happen. And the first is that HIV mRNA is pr produced in a cascade. So what that means is that if you look here on the right, um, we actually have a square cell now where the nucleus is this darker gray area here and the cytoplasm is this area here. So as I said, the viral DNA will integrate into the host cell genome and then um, you have transcription. But what happens is that you first have transcription of a very long transcript. And then once that transcript is released from the DNA and it's finished being transcribed, you have production of the second transcript from that first one. And it's called unsplice, singly spliced, and multiply spliced. These transcripts are actually exported to the cytoplasm, but the multiply So one of these proteins is actually responsible for a positive feedback. And this positive feedback is the second feature and commitment of HIV. What TAT does is it shuttles back into the nucleus and it uh, transactivates the promoter and it induces a positive feedback. So this positive feedback, when positive feedbacks work, causes more transcription, which causes more protein. And this allows for these large fluctuations in protein expression that generates the cellular diversity. So um, these large fluctuations allow HIV to span two different phenotypes. The one in red is one which effectively would cause active viral reproduction. And the one in blue is the one that causes uh, or, or would generate latency because so you can already see that if you keep going with this, with this TAP protein or, or positive feedback and there's nothing there to keep it in check, then these large fluctuations would continue and you can't actually commit to one fate. So that's where the last feature comes in. And that's a negative feedback that um, is caused by this protein here called REV. So what REV does is it also shuttles back into the nucleus and it exports these two transcripts, so unspliced and singly spliced transcripts. So now you see why it's so important to have this cascade, right? Because, because there's this cascade and a precursor product relationship that um, when the REV exports all of these uh, transcripts into the cytoplasm, there's no more precursors to produce this final product. And that's how this negative feedback works which would mean that these fluctuations generated by TAT in this exploration phase um, that drive the cellular or the HIV's decision, they can be attenuated to allow HIV to commit to its fate of active viral replication. So now I'm gonna show you a little bit of data that supports this. Um, so uh, first of all, how can we show that there's this, this cascade in production between the different uh, mRNA classes? We can do this using single molecule RNA fish, where we essentially generate uh, or, or target the different classes of the mRNA using different probes, and, um, and then we can visualize them. And we can do that in, uh, in two different um, sort of treatment conditions. One is TNF. TNF, it just activates um, viral transcription and translation. So it's, it's something that, that we always use in experiments. We add it and then you induce transcription. Um, the important time or treatment is actually actinomycin D. Actinomycin D shuts down transcription. So of course, if you shut down transcription, you'd expect mRNA to start decreasing over time, right? Because you don't have the production of new mRNA, you just have the degradation of this mRNA. So we can look at these three different classes of transcripts and we can ask if 
you have this cascade of production from unspliced to singly to multiply spliced mRNA using this single molecule fish technique that allows us to visualize mRNA. So I want you to focus on this actinomycin D treatment where um, once we shut down um, transcription, you can see that um, that's the unspliced class of transcripts, it starts decreasing um, over time as you expect, right? Shut down transcription, there shouldn't be new production of mRNA. On the other hand, the singly spliced classes of transcript, you see an increase followed by a decrease, even though transcription is in principle shut down. And this multiply spliced in the time frame that we did this experiments increase over time. So we indeed have this production or this cascade production between the three different classes of mRNA. So the next thing we wanna, wanna check is that these positive feedback indeed drives this faith exploration that we're talking about. And we can do this in two steps. We can first, we need to be able to visualize the protein production. And we can do this by adding GFP into the NEF reading frame. And the second thing we can do is we can get rid of this negative feedback so that we can see what happens in the presence of only this positive feedback. So the first thing when we, uh, to check that we can actually see GFP production, um, we can do microscopy, time-lapse microscopy, where we can look at uh, several hundreds to thousands of cells, quantify them at a single cell resolution and follow the GFP expression over time. So that's nice, it's great we can do that. Um, so the next question is, how can we get rid of the negative feedback? So this is actually kind of tricky. Um, so it's not a, it's not a, um, or, or what, we, what we ended up doing is effectively getting rid of the negative feedback by increasing the, the cascade production so that the, by comparison, all of the mRNA is being pushed in one direction so it can't actually be, um, uh, be exported into the, into the cytoplasm, effectively getting rid of the negative feedback. So we can now compare the situation where we only have the positive feedback to the situation where we have both the positive and the negative feedback. So when we do that, again, looking at single cells, looking at this GFP that we've added, um, uh, and we can track these single cells over time, on the left, you can see the quantification um, only for the positive feedback. And on the right, you can see it when we have both the positive and the negative feedback. And you can quite, or immediately see quite a strong difference, right? So on the left, you can see that if we get rid of the negative feedback, the positive feedback indeed has a very strong, uh, a much higher mean, which is what we expect. The second thing you can notice is that in the presence of both the positive and the negative feedback, you see this, this um, what we call overshoot kinetics. And that's quite classic hallmark of a negative feedback kicking in in this phase right here. And then the last thing is that in the presence of only the positive feedback, you see that the distribution in numbers of, of uh, GFP produced per cell is very, very broad. So there's a lot of diversity in the amounts of viral proteins that are being produced in the presence of only the positive feedback. However, in the presence of both the positive and the negative feedback, this variability is, is diminished quite a lot. So the last thing that we, uh, that we can also look at is, um, is what this negative feedback or the presence of this negative feedback does to stable commitment to this decision. And again, we can compare our mutant, which is positive feedback only, to the wild type scenario, which has both the positive and the negative feedback. However, now we're doing the experiment slightly differently. So we've stimulated all our cells, essentially forcing all cells to make a decision to, um, to act to viral replication. So we turn on the transcription of all of our cells. Um, so it's no longer a binary decision, it's, it's um, an enforced decision. And then what we do is we remove the stimulus that forces all these cells to, to make the decision to actively replicate. Um, 
or to actively transcribe um, viral mRNA. Um, and once we wash that out, we can watch what happens to commitment to that decision over time. And that's on this axis here. So this is for the mutant only in the presence of this positive feedback. And what happens is that in the course of 58 hours, which is this last distribution that you see here, even though you only have a very strong positive feedback, these cells actually don't stick to their decision to be on. A lot of them, they switch off their transcription machinery and, um, and don't commit to that initial, um, initial fate that they've uh, been forced to enter. So how does this compare to the wild type virus? Where the wild type, again, remember, has both the positive and the negative feedback. So as expected, presence of the negative feedback means there's a slight shift in mean, like we already saw in the previous slides. And, um, um, and this shift of mean is expected because we now have positive and negative feedback. And when we look at what happens over time is even though the, the wild type virus starts at a lower mean, it actually stays in this on state much longer. So I, I, think, I think this is a very interesting, interesting result because even though you have a negative feedback, which in principle decreases the mean, you keep your cells actively transcribing um, for much longer. So this negative feedback actually allows HIV to commit to this actively transcribing state, even though to start with, they're not as active and they're transcribing much less mRNA and protein. So that sort of summarizes the, the scientific part of this talk where I showed you that um, HIV mRNA is produced in a cascade, um, not how I'm showing you here, but in a cascade. Um, that the positive feedback drives faith exploration and the negative feedback actually stabilizes commitment. So how did I get here from a sort of career perspective? So I, as Vilarm already mentioned, I did a PhD here in, um, in Nijmegen, but before I did a PhD, I actually did my master's in chemical biology at University of Warwick in the UK. And I quite quickly realized that I had a much higher affinity for the sort of bio, biology part of the course than, and the biophysics part of it than the, the chemistry and um, I would say primarily the organic chemistry part of this course. Uh, so that led actually quite nicely into my PhD where I focused on this uh, synthetic cell project that many of you know about. Um, which, which was a first step into a more hardcore biology direction. But my first years I, I spent optimizing this in vitro transcription translation kit, where it actually didn't feel like I was doing much, even though I was doing things probably 24 seven. But in terms of, of output, um, I, I think a lot of you might know that feeling and know um, that it can be a little frustrating, but at least for me, um, so, so for the, the, those of you that are still in this situation, hang in there because it's even more rewarding when you sort of fight through that wall and manage to, to optimize whatever system you're working on, which in our case allowed us to ask how synthetic cells make decisions. And what we found is that even synthetic cells, so remember going back to this energy diagram where in synthetic cells in principle, we can make that these external stimuli that shape the energy diagram completely flat. But even there, we can see that under some conditions, we can drive these synthetic cells to make noisy decisions. So that then sort of led to my postdoc where I finally got to work with some real cells where uh, I actually made the, the fun uh, realization that what we call in vitro is actually just cell work. Um, and what we call in, vit in vivo is mouse work. So there's, there's a shift in, in the views there. Um, and 
as we all mentioned, that led me back to starting my lab here because I love Nijmegen and I love the uh, Radboud and, and how we do science here. So that sort of sums up what's uh, or how I got here and how we want to ask these questions. So just to sum up real fast um, or with some acknowledgements, I of course need to thank my postdoc supervisor because the, the work I showed you here I did during my postdoc. The other lab members that uh, and collaborators that contributed to this. And thank you for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. Well, Michael, thank you. That was a great presentation. Uh, also very nice to see at the end that even though there must have been some noisy decisions, you made a commitment to come to Nijmegen. So that is beautiful to see. Um, you've also shown us really nicely that uh, even though the cell is so complex with so many different things going on, uh, in these HIV infected cells, you show how, well, maybe less than 10 different steps uh, lead to very different types of outcome in these cells when you control the different processes. Uh, so controlling what either the feed positive feedback loop or the positive and negative feedback loop. Uh, and so you, you sort of tackled a very, very complex problem. Uh, and I think you did very well in explaining it to us. Uh, but then you also did a lot of really beautiful experiments uh, that uh, really shed some light on this that I don't think anybody has looked at uh, in such detail before. So, so I congratulate you on that. That's a major piece of work. Uh, um, in the meantime, uh, I think there are probably questions uh, coming in from the audience. Uh, and uh, I can uh, look at people on the screen now. Um, I see uh, King Amatua has a question on uh, what influenced the choice of the topic of your research? Is this specific for what time in my career? Just generally, I guess? Well, I think um, maybe if you would highlight, for example, um, because you're, you're obviously studying noisy commitment in, in cells, which probably there are many different examples, but I think maybe the HIV is maybe a good example uh, already, I think. Yeah. yeah, so there's a there's a number of different things that, that goes into that. Um, and I think there's always the component of who you work with and the questions that you work on. Um, in terms of uh, the question, HIV is a very straightforward uh, system to study, right? Because there's this very clear binary um, choice. So you can really say, uh, like, it's, it's, it's not as vague as maybe some other um, some other circuits are. And the other component or the other nice thing about HIV is that there are indeed all these circuits that you can study, right? So you can do this tweaking. And the second part of it is that um, a part of the decision to go to do your postdoc in a certain lab, at least for me personally, it also has a lot to do with who you're working with, like what you're looking for in terms of a mentor, in terms of a lab atmosphere, um, and, and that went into that choice too. So at least for me during out, during my career, it's always been those two, those two sides of it. I think this was actually an important question because also Francesca Rivello and Oliver McGuire had similar questions. And Francesca also was wondering whether the study that you did on HIV, whether that would also be representative, uh, in the behavior of other viruses. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, I think, yeah, <laughs> I think it's, it's possible for sure. Um, so what was actually done in, um, in the same lab that I was in, but it's a slightly different approach is that they, they found that the variability in, in capsid pro in, in proteins that the virus expresses. So this is in CMV. So that that actually is also um, sort of a bet hedging strategy. So that I, I think it's so maybe so I I'm guess the simple answer here, is I think maybe. that we're still, sorry. I guess the simple answer is maybe. Yeah. So <laughs> that would be the simple answer. Um, but I do think that uh, that there's um, there's this 
noise ultimately gives this bed hedging ability, right? So it allows in a, in a relatively um, short time scale, it allows uh, cells or viruses or, or bacteria to, um, to survive under varying conditions. And that's why I think it's likely that a lot of these organisms, I mean, you see it in, in um, coming back in, in cancer cells um, as well. So I, I do think it's likely. Um, I don't, I don't want, let's, let's keep it at that. <laughs> you mentioned uh, whether there might be applications or whether there might be relevant sort of similar decision processes in cancer cells. Uh, uh, does this mean that you think you can broaden it to maybe other diseases or uh, medical areas? Yeah, I think um, I think the difficulty is in really differentiating between this this short term sort of noisy decision and actual um, an actual stimulus induced decisions, right? So again, the nice thing about this system is that you can you can really you can really flatten this landscape. And um, a question that does always come back is how how sure are you that what you're studying is, is really a true probabilistic event and not just something that you're just can't measure yet. So uh, I think we might need to have a discussion about what words we use, right? So I don't think it's as, as clear as it's either probabilistic or it's, it's caused by some sort of external stimuli. Maybe related to that, Kinga Matua had another question where she asked whether the the size of the uh, the RNA or the genetic material uh, would that influence the behavior of the virus inside the cell. I think you mentioned that a little bit, where you um, discussed the different slicing uh, splicing steps uh, in the RNA. Um, so the length of the molecules would that play a role, you think, or is that too subtle? I think it depends more on the consequence of those sizes. So if there's just a difference in size, then I guess, and the only reason or the only, the only consequence of that is that diffusions are so diffusion is slowed down. You probably wouldn't see this as an extra effect. In this case, yes, we have the different splicing products and there you do have different sizes, but it's actually more that the different sizes are a result of something happening as a cascade, right? So you first have the longest, and then you like chop out a bit, and then you have the middle and the other one. So it's so it's not actually that the different sizes are causing the effect; it's their consequence of an effect that is necessary for this to happen. I think I get that. Uh, um, Niels has a question. Uh, where he wonders what the advantages of multicellular systems to have stochastic expression. So taking into account that their environment is supposed to be much more stable. So a multicellular organism. Um, so <laughs> there's, always, there's always multiple layers to this, right? Um, for a multicellular organism as an organism to have, Stochastic events is is very hard, right? Because it would have to be some sort of coordinated stochastic events, and then you might go in the direction of deterministic. For the individual cells within that organism to have stochastic events, um, for example, during development, um, that is something where you could imagine that uh, that it it depends on the time scale, right? Um, so at least the way I like to think about it is you have genetic perturbations. Those are very long permanent time scales. Then you have epigenetic that are very shorter time scales. And then you have stochastic or semi-stochastic, semi-deterministic events that happen at the shortest time scale. But some for, for things to transition from this very short time scale to the longer epigenetic time scale, you need to have some mechanisms in place that allow for commitment or diversity. And that's what we're interested in studying. So to answer the question of how is it beneficial for a multicellular organism, I, I think it's beneficial for the process of development maybe, or, or not beneficial, but of relevance. So there are a lot of processes that are not so much 
beneficial for the organism as a whole, but they are in a way hardwired almost into the yeah. different processes that the cell undertakes to uh, undergo development, for example. Uh, um, related to that, Jeroen van der Wiel has a question where he wonders whether the, uh, the stochastics of, for example, the HIV uh, commitment that you just mentioned, uh, uh, whether that is also influenced by its neighbors. So do you think, for example, yeah. would there be an effect if the neighboring cell has committed to be in the high or low expression state to also influence its neighbors? Well, in, in this particular case, uh, it sort of depends what the cells are secreting. Um, and since these cells were actually in, in what we call suspension, you expect that everything that's secreted, all cells are more or less equally um, susceptible to. So that's why, I mean, I don't want to be as strong and say we've completely flattened that landscape, but we, we try to flatten it as much as possible. Um, I, I do think that, that with other cell types, for example, adherent cell types, their cell to cell contacts are more important. Um, the location, right, the microenvironment that that particular cell is found in um, is probably plays a way more important role. So, you, so people have looked at this and, and you can sort of try and predict um, cellular expression levels based on the expression levels of neighbors. So, so it definitely plays a role. And, it, and again, it, this goes back to, it is difficult to detangle those different effects. And that's why we try as much as possible. Probably in 10 years time, somebody's gonna say, okay, we have a way better way of flattening that landscape. And then everyone's gonna shift in that direction. I think that last comment in a way answers also Xin Yu Hu's question, uh, who wonders what the biggest challenge uh, is to study noise in mammalian cells. And I think you, in a way, just answer that question by uh, flattening that landscape uh, in such a way that you can actually study these processes. So, 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 so Mike, that um, um, wraps up our, um, uh, a lot of the questions that I had coming in uh, for sort of on the real content of your talk. Um, and, but there are also some other questions uh, uh, that um, William Robinson, for example, wonders uh, how you decide whether you're spending too much time in the lab and not enough time reading. Uh, or vice versa. I, I would generally think you could never spend enough time in the lab, but maybe you have a different view on that. Well, I was about to say, I, I don't know what to advise here because you are standing in front of me and I don't want to, you know, tread on any toes or anything. But, <laughs> um, I think that's very hard because I do think a lot of us have the tendency to want to go into the lab and do things ourselves, right? Um, as scientists, uh, a lot of us are maybe control freaks. Um, so we, we tend to want to go into the lab and not read. And um, often we reinvent the wheel, right? Because we don't read. So um, some advice that I've had uh, that has not quite worked for me yet, but maybe it works for you, is that try and see reading as a relaxing, like, oh, I'm going to have a cup of coffee and, and, and read my, I don't know, two papers on a specific time on that day. And, well, one uh, of my colleagues in Cambridge used to say that if it's really important, then somebody will tell me about it. Uh, so yeah. he didn't read anything himself. Right. I mean, journal clubs set them <laughs> up everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> now, Actually, yeah. another question I had was uh, from Francesca, uh, who wonders uh, uh, what you learned from your postdoc experience in the US and whether you would advise young researchers to spend a couple of years abroad to do a postdoc. And I think the context of that is that uh, I think often I and many of my colleagues uh, always say, well, you have to do a postdoc abroad, especially when you want to go into an academic career. Uh, and then within a few seconds, I can mention uh, quite a few examples of people who didn't do that and have a very successful career. So the system is certainly not binary. And, uh, but, but how do you look at that? Yeah, I, um, for me, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I was a, a very good decision to do that. Uh, I love the lab I was in. I love the environment. San Francisco is a great place to be to to learn a lot um, get sort of exposed to a lot of different science um, so I, I think that's 
overall, you don't have to, I think. I think uh, you can find good labs locally. I mean, of course, there's good labs anywhere. So um, as long as I wouldn't prioritize location over a good uh, research question or a good fit. Um, for me personally, it was I, I was lucky and I had all three. So in that case, I think it's, it's a good experience. I also think from a more personal perspective, being in a different country around a different culture, it's, it's a great experience, but I know a lot of you being here, you're already experiencing that. So, yeah. Well, experiencing Trump America is quite an experiencing, I'm sure. Uh, um, I I'm think told also this is reported, right? in, so. in your case, I know you already speak uh, more than 10 different languages, but uh, I, I guess in your case, you also now picked up American English, I hope. Uh, I, I do yeah, notice a little I didn't... bit. Uh... <laughs> I, was, I never really thought of myself of having an American accent, but I've been told that because uh, I used to have a British one, so that's disappeared, I've been told. <laughs> I think you have to communicate more with Will and uh, and Oliver at some point. Uh, yeah, um, coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michael had another question, uh, and <clears throat> he uh, would like to hear your opinion on on where the publishing system will be in the future. Open access, community based. Uh, uh, we just saw in Nature that the um, the price for open access publishing in Nature will be set at about six and a half thousand euros, I think, and they are thinking about. Uh, charging you 2000 euros for having the pleasure of being reviewed at least uh, by nature uh, wh wh where do you see things going yeah i think where i see things going where i hope things go are two different things but uh i i think the the um, the major shift should be or or would be in in terms of the review process right uh, if the review process or when the review process becomes um, more open more transparent um, maybe uh, maybe then maybe it's wishful thinking but maybe the 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 discrepancy in in journal um, in the qualities of journals or these large differences that might be diminished a little bit because people can actually see what the reviewers asked, how quick that process was, um, how easy or, or, or honest that process was. Um, so for me, what I'd like to see is for the whole review process to be more transparent. What that means in terms of, well, open app access publishing is of course great. Um, the prices that are associated with that is a little surprising, weird. I don't know what term I'd, I'd use for that. It's a business. Uh, sorry? It's a business. Yeah, it is. Um, and you keep seeing more journals pop up, right? Uh, so many sub journals of sub journals of sub journals, <laughs> which. Yeah, yeah, so many predatory uh, journals as well that uh, con constantly bombard you with requests for publishing or reviewing. So. Uh, definitely I think it's like... also hard for um, for people who shift fields, right? Because what, what kind of journals do you look at? Uh, what papers do you value above other ones if, if you're starting out from going from a PhD to a postdoc or, or trying to answer a question in a different field? It makes it very hard. So you mentioned earlier uh, when you were talking about uh, different postdoc positions uh, in different countries uh, you said the um, the question and the lab is is probably more important than the location and so I was wondering uh, who do you regard as the most inspirational scientists of this time uh, and it's okay if you don't mention me <laughs> Well, I've been, uh, I think your, your production team has, um, has already told me how I should answer that question. <laughs> so, so, of course, uh, uh, Wilhelm Hook. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, I, um, I think that's hard because I, f I find, I personally get a lot of inspiration out of, out of talks, out of listening to people's talks. And I think that, uh, the science somebody does can be exceptional. Um, but if I'm in a talk where the science might be from a general regard, not as fancy, um, but the talk sort of takes me, um, I, 
I somehow value that very much. Um, I was hoping that you were going to mention names, of course, right? The viewers yeah, I know. at home, I, they, they want names. Right. So I've, I've, I, I don't know how many of you know him, but um, I think one of the best speakers I've ever seen is Arjun Raj. So he's at UPenn. And uh, if you can find a talk, buy him, attend it. Um, and I, I think you'll, if you're ever down and don't want to be in the lab, I think he'll energize you to, to go back into the lab and try and figure out whatever it is that you're trying to figure out. I think you have to send us a link for that one. Uh, sounds, sounds very good. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Maike, uh, I'm, I'm afraid uh, we are sort of having to wrap up. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you again uh, for, um, for really uh, giving us a fantastic uh, presentation uh, tonight. Um, if there is uh, one final thing you would like to say, uh, could you, what would you suggest to students uh, to, pursue, to, pursue, to pursue in a, in a career? What would you uh, uh, tell them to do, how to achieve that? Talk to people. Um, I think that a lot of people or students, or at least when I was a student, I um, was very shy in confronting people, or not confronting, but approaching people. And I think uh, a lot of us actually like talking about our experiences and, and I mean, we love giving advice. If it's good advice, that I don't know. But uh, yeah, just email people, ask for advice. Worst that can happen is they say they don't have time. Thank you so much. Uh, Maike, that's all the time we have tonight. Um, I would like to thank uh, everybody who made it possible tonight because you might just see me sitting here in front of a piece of art and a white wall. Uh, all around me is infrastructure to make this happening. Many laptops, wires, uh, microphones. So I would like to thank uh, Leo Fernandez, uh, Lena Dines, uh, Pierre van Duppe, uh, Glenn Boyanov, Will Robinson for really making this work tonight. Uh, it's a, uh, I very much enjoyed this uh, first uh, pilot episode of the Late Night Conference. Uh, I hope you did as well. I look forward to seeing you all in January. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, go out and do some good science or read up on the la latest literature. Uh, thank you all. Good night. Bye bye.